Ah, mes amis, bienvenue à Arms Oubliés. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we have another Q&A session, and today it is specifically Q&A about French firearms. Now, why French? Well, do we need a reason? We do have a reason. The reason is, of course, I am uh, getting close to the end of the process of writing a book on French military rifles, from the Chasse to the FAMAS. And so I thought it'd be cool to uh, use a Q&A video to kind of promote that. In fact, at the moment we actually have a contest going on to come up with uh, cover art for the book. So if you're interested in checking that out, maybe submit uh, a, a proposed piece of cover art yourself, win a cool awesome premiere copy of the book as a prize, or just take a look at what other people are submitting themselves, vote on which one you think should get the Audience Choice Award, anything like that, head over to FrenchRifleBook.com. Figured that's a, a pretty uncomplicated URL to use for the project. So while you're there you can also sign up for notifications when the book is ready to be ordered, um, and anything else that's going on with the book that you might want to know about. So uh, with that said, uh, Q&A questions, as always, come from our Patreon supporters. Anyone from a buck a month and up uh, is able to submit questions when I ask for questions, uh, basically once a month. And um, well, let's get right into it. Our first question is from Logan. What is your favorite French pistol, rifle, and machine gun? Uh, let's see, favorite French pistol would be two options, either the 1873 revolver, just because it is cool and old-fashioned and I just really like the looks of it. By the way, if you're curious what the 1873 looks like, if you have ever seen The Mummy with Brendan Fraser, the original one, he actually carries a brace of them in that movie. One of the few places, like outside of specifically like French historical documentaries, where you'll actually see one. Uh, or the 1935A pistol, which is a very elegant nice handling and compact little gun in the 765 French long cartridge. Uh, that was designed by Charles Petter, uh, who would go on to design the SIG 210, which is of course one of the iconic excellent service pistols ever made. And the French 1935A is kind of basically a scaled down version of the same thing. So they're hard to shoot because the ammunition's so hard to get, but they're really nice guns. Uh, favorite French rifle I think would be the Indochina Bertier. I think it's, again, just a very elegant, good-looking rifle. Uh, and then <sighs> favorite French machine gun is a bit more difficult because, let's be honest, the Shosha is not a great gun. I may enjoy it, but it's not a particularly good gun. Um, it probably would have to come down to the Chatelero 2429, which is perfectly serviceable, but it doesn't really excite me all that much. So. Um, Next question is, Joe, how did you become a Francophile? I figured we should t cover that in uh, in this Q&A, it seems appropriate, although I have mentioned, I've discussed this a couple times before. Uh, basically I was looking for a particular specialty to focus on in my firearms collecting, and I had, I had a couple of French guns already, and when I looked at them I realized that they embodied a lot of what I find generally interesting, which is to say, unique and different and unusual. So the French arms program was largely run by uh, a number of state arsenal manufacturers. They didn't try to bring in, um, they didn't buy designs from other countries. The way so many people in the world at, you know, say the turn of the century were buying Mausers, or a couple decades before that were buying Winchesters or Remingtons. The French wanted to design things domestically. and. Uh, they kept all of their designs as state secrets. Um, they treated this as a very protected sort of uh, important military technology sort of area. And as a result they ended up with designs that weren't really copied by anybody else because they weren't available to anybody else, and they were also designs that generally weren't copies of anything else. So um, the French uh, were early adopters or early experimenters with a lot of different semi-auto mechanisms and systems. I find all of that very interesting. And um, also French rifles here in the US are relatively underappreciated. Uh, they cost less than a lot of other nationalities, and that makes them easier and, uh, well, easier to collect and acquire. So um, all of that together, in some ways it would have been nice if I had ended up picking a country that, say, spoke English, or spoke a language that was actually pronounced the same way it's spelled, unlike French, but that's a separate issue. 
Uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is from Ian, a different Ian. Uh, how effective was the Labelle's recessed primer pocket at preventing chain detonations in the magazine? Why has no one else used this system? That is a very good pair of questions. Uh, the system, the Labelle, was actually very good at preventing chain detonation uh, in two ways. First off, there is, I think what you're referring to here, is there's actually a groove in, in the cartridge case head um, around the primer. And so it's kind of like this gully that a bullet, a pointed bullet, will tend to rest in. And once the bullet's in there, uh, because the whole magazine tube is under spring pressure, um, there's no, the, the bullet isn't able to easily slip up out of that groove and make contact with the primer of the cartridge in front of it. So um, that's a good thing by itself. And then what really makes this system work well is the extreme taper and the large rim of the Labelle cartridge, the 8 Labelle cartridge. Uh, when you lay one of those things on the table, it really does just like point at a nice downward angle. And if you lay out a series of 8 Labelle cartridges, you'll find that they never are going to try to actually line up bullet tip to primer because of the taper. They're going to lie on their sides at an angle facing downwards, and the more pressure you put on them with a magazine spring, the more they're going to try to push outwards around the rim of each cartridge instead of inwards towards the center. So uh, these two things together worked very well to prevent uh, detonations in the magazine. In fact, I am not aware of any Labelle magazine detonations. It's possible something took place at some point, but I've never heard of one, I've never seen evidence of one. Now of course the reason why nobody else did this is because the taper and the rim of the cartridge were huge problems elsewhere. Um, what most other countries were doing at this point, when the tube magazine was a thing, people were using round nose cartridges that, um, a lot of them actually were also relatively tapered and had relatively large rims, but then they either were small bore cartridges with round bullets, or they were flat nosed bullets. Um, cartridges like the 11 millimeter Mauser, where you know the, the flat nose of the cartridge is large enough that it's not going to detonate a primer anyway, even if they are nose to tip. By the time uh, Spitzer projectiles were really coming into vogue, the tube magazine thing was on its way out. The rimmed cartridges were largely on their way out, and people were adopting uh, staggered box magazines instead because, well, they just work a lot better in general. Next question is from Spencer. It says, was there ever a plan to produce more of the RSC rifles after World War I? Perhaps an updated rifle of the same type? Uh, the answer is not really. Uh, so once the war was actually over, the, the French military really jumped at the opportunity to get rid of the 8 Labelle cartridge. Um, and replace it with a basically a straight walled or a, a bottlenecked, um, but generally straight uh, rimless cartridge, which would be the 7.5. And the RSC was just not a rifle really compatible with adapting to 7.5. So there were, as far as I know, there were never any plans or experiments with converting the RSC to 7.5. You know, you've got that whole bottom feeding clip system, the receivers are all pretty intricately machined specifically to take these clips, the whole magazine cover assembly is specifically for these clips, uh, and there were some concerns about the rest of the rifle. Um, they, didn't, they didn't want to stick with the RSC, even if they could modify it uh, up to 7.5, because they thought they could design a better rifle. And this was right after the war, when these plans were all being put into place. Um, it wasn't. It wouldn't be until like the 20s have really kind of dragged all the way out without much progress here, that maybe someone would have decided they'd be better off sticking with the RSCs. But by then it was too late. Now, during the war, there were absolutely plans to increase the production. Um, in fact, I've seen some documents that suggest that ultimately the French plan, the intention, was to provide every soldier as a standard issue rifle with an RSC 1918 carbine, and that would have been a tremendous step forward. Uh, in infantry armament uh, during World War I. That, that could have given uh, the Germans really a run for their money in the small arms department. But the war ended at the end of 1918, and that plan never came to fruition. Um, in fact, they didn't really get any 1918 carbines into the field uh, before the war ended at all. So kind of like the US Pedersen device in that way, or the British Farquhar Hill. Big plans cut short by the end of the war. Kevin says, 
why was French weapons development almost exclusively government run rather than based around private companies submitting their designs to trials like almost everyone else? Well, I think some of it is just the bureaucratic nature of the French government and the French military. Part of it is that the French government really didn't want to pay royalties on private uh, designs. You see, th you see that with things like the Hotchkiss machine gun, where the, it was available in like 1897, and the Japanese adopted it that early. But the French government decided to stick with its own uh, arsenal produced Saint-Étienne 1907 instead, despite it being really obviously not as good of a gun. And they wouldn't grudgingly accept the Hotchkiss until 1914, when the outbreak of war really kind of gave them no other choice. So because they didn't want to pay royalties, and presumably because they wanted to keep a lot of this technology secret in a way that you couldn't really do with private companies, the French government uh, paid for, ran, uh, three or four major arsenal complexes. And I think if you're a private company in that sort of environment, you don't have a whole lot of incentive to be trying to submit designs to the French government. Often as not, what would happen is they would um, accept guns for trial, or they'd set up, you know, request uh, submissions, and look at them all, figure out the best elements of each, and then go build them in the state arsenal and not pay anyone royalties for them. So it doesn't take very many uh, instances seeing that happen as a private entrepreneur to decide that maybe the French government isn't really who you want as a client. So ultimately, I think it was it was uh, an effect from both sides. The government wanted uh, to control all of its own production and intellectual property, and private individuals who maybe could have competed, looking at this from the outside, decided that they were kind of incentivized not to. Tanner says, uh, what is current French arms manufacturing capability in France, if any? Um, at the large level, none. Um, similar to England in that way, honestly, well, uh, the issue was that the, because this French arms development had always been done by government-run arsenals, when those were shut down it didn't leave a whole lot um, of arms production capability out there, industrial capacity. So when you're talking about a main infantry rifle, you're going to want a couple hundred thousand of them as a country the size of France, and no, there is no factory capable of doing that in France right now. Now they do have small arms production capability, but it's on a much smaller scale. Um, things like the, the PGM rifles, uh, precision rifles, some hunting rifles, custom stuff, small scale um, guns are absolutely still made in France. But at the level of a major industrial concern, the likes of you know, in America, the likes of Colt, Winchester, Remington, those guys, there aren't any. Um, England has had the same thing happen. Uh, the British Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield is no more. Um, interestingly, in, in Germany the same thing has sort of happened, in that the government-run arsenals have also disappeared. Uh, but they're left with a couple, well one in particular, Heckler & Koch, uh, Koch have one large private company that happens to be located in Germany. Next question is from John, says, how does the FAMAS fit into the general European timeline of bullpups? L85, AUG, F2000, etc. What's the progenitor of the whole concept? Uh, it's right in the, there was basically one major wave of military large-scale bullpup rifle adaptation or adoption, uh, and that would be basically the late 70s, early 80s. So the British had the L85, um, right in that period, SA-80, early 1980s. Uh, the FAMAS was adopted in 1979, or went into production in 79. Uh, its development started in like 1970. Uh, the Steyr AUG was adopted in 1977. So it's really right here at the end of the 70s and early 80s that, that European militaries get this bullpup idea and kind of run with it. Now they're not the first. Um, the British did technically adopt a bullpup in the early 1950s with the EM-2, but it was very quickly unadopted um, in favor of various NATO considerations. And I think what really drove this, you, you wouldn't have the bullpup until you had major use of submachine guns by militaries, because one of the driving factors for adopting a bullpup was consolidating the roles of the submachine gun and the rifle. So. In the early days, if you're still, especially when you go very early, when you're talking about still conceptually thinking about fighting in ranks, bullpups would never be adopted. 
uh, because one of the reasons for a long rifle when you're fighting in ranks is to make sure that the rearmost rank, their muzzles are in front of the frontmost rank. So you don't have the rear rank accidentally shooting the front rank in the back. That would be a major problem. And the idea of minimizing overall length of the rifle is counterproductive in that era. Then you get to the bolt action period, and there are bolt action uh, bull pups, but they're all really quite awkward. It's not until you have self-loading rifles that bull pups become possible. So, and, and none of them were really, they really came out before World War II. So the 50s were the earliest when it could happen, and it didn't really take off until the 70s. I think today we're at a position where some of the downsides of the bull pup have really become better known, and people are less concerned with having a particularly long barrel in a combat rifle. You look at what militaries are adopting today, and they're generally not 20-inch barrels or, or anything longer than that. They're generally 11 and a half, 14 and a half, maybe 16-inch barrels. And at that point, your conventional rifle is getting pretty close to the same overall size as a 1970s bullpup. So why bother? Uh, next question is from Lane who says, once the 7.5 French was adopted, do you think the French would have been better served in World War II by producing the RSC 1918 chambered for the new cartridge uh, rather than uh, adopting Moss 36 and its accompanying semi-auto? Or was it simply too antiquated by then to be significant? I should have noticed this kind of already touched on this. Um, no, I think the, the, the RSC was a good rifle for the time, but given 20 years uh, of development period, there was definitely the opportunity to develop something a lot better. The Moss 40, the French, the semi-auto that they were developing, allegedly from like 1924, um, that Moss 40 was really a quite good rifle. And it is very similar in mechanical layout to the Moss 44 that was ultimately produced right after World War II. They should have developed it faster, but it was much simpler than the RSC easier to clean than the RSC, a more compact gun, more durable gun. It was in every way a, a, a generational step forward, and what they should have done was develop it faster, not try to hold over the RSC in 7.5. Tim wants to know, do I speak French? If so, do you think it makes it easier to research French guns when you can actually speak the language that the technical information is written in? Uh, the answer is I don't speak French, but I am working on it. Um, I'm at the point where I can like order a meal in a restaurant, but like if I ask for directions I have a difficult time uh, comprehending the answer when spoken in normal rapid-fire uh, native French. So I'm working on it. It's easier to read than it is to understand verbally. Um, and as for your other question, yeah, it absolutely makes things easier for researching. In particular, well, this probably applies universally, but uh, because they're, unless you're studying guns from a country where the native language is English, most of the best literature is probably going to be in some other language, and that's definitely the case with France. Um, there are probably a dozen good books on French rifles, uh, French firearms written in French. Um, those have been instrumental for me in researching my own book, which will be written in English. and. Translating them is a huge pain. It is far easier to be able to just understand them as you're reading. Uh, beyond that, I have plans for some other research I would like to do on a couple of more specific French subjects, in particular the RSC rifles. Doing that will require uh, doing first-hand research in the French archives, and that will absolutely require uh, reading French. In fact, not only will it require understanding the language, it'll also require being able to read the cursive script handwriting that French is typically written in. That's something you also see as an issue with uh, German uh, resources and archives, is that fracture, uh, very, uh, very stereotypical Germanic script, is what a lot of their official records are written in. And that can be a tricky uh, set of characters to properly you know, under read and understand if you're not used to it. So. French and their script is kind of the same way. So I'm working on it. Hopefully within a couple of years I'll be fluent enough. God, it, it, it seems hopeless to even think that I will ever achieve fluency, but hopefully at some point I will, and that will really be a big help for me. Uh, Brandon, in your opinion, which was a better combat firearm, the Lebel or the Berthier? I will say if you give me the option of choosing the five-round Berthier, I would go with the five-round Berthier carbine. 
Um, I would call that, or maybe even the, the five round Indochina Gartier. Um, the Lebel is kind of a clunky gun to operate. The, the eight round capacity of the tube magazine is cool, but the tube magazine itself is less cool. Uh, once you empty that tube magazine, it's, it's very slow to reload it compared to the Monlicker type packet loading clips of the Berthier where you can reload it quite quickly. So give me a five round Berthier and I will be the most happy, short of a semi-auto rifle. Uh, Mike R says, why did it take France so long to fully adopt an infantry arm to replace the Moss 4956? I'm aware of interim weapons used in place of them, but why did France not tool up to make a more conventional battle rifle in this era before the FAMAS? Um, honestly, I'm not entirely sure about the premise. Um, the 4956 is every bit the, the generation of battle rifle of the FAL and the G3. Uh, the only place where it's not quite up to par is the magazine capacity, the choice to go with 10 instead of 20 rounds, but that really has nothing to do with the mechanics of the gun itself. Uh, mechanically, the 4956 is is every bit as modern as its um, as the other Cold War battle rifles, which is actually rather impressive if you consider that the the design was a pre World War II design. It was really the Moss 40, developed through the late 1930s, that was that, that directly translated into the Moss 44 that went into production immediately after World War II. Um, it's tilting bolt, it's got a very simple direct gas impingement action, and there is no reason that they would have had to update it until they wanted to go to an intermediate cartridge um, instead of the full power cartridge. Uh, the thing even has an integrated scope rail on every rifle. It's It mounts optics more easily than a, Fowl, a stock Fowler G3, it's simpler to operate, it's as reliable as the G3 and more reliable than the FAL, it's got good iron sights to it, aperture sights. I don't think they had any reason to update it until they wanted 5.56. Jeremy says, and we actually we have a couple questions on this, so let me combine a couple. Jeremy wants to know if a modern FAMAS that uses PMAGs would be feasible. Um, actually, I can answer that one straight up. Yes, because they've actually made one. Um, the French Navy adopted the FAMAS G2, so the standard original rifle was the F1 pattern. Uh, the, there was then a G1 pattern, which was a modification which didn't get adopted by anybody. It was kind of the, the economy version of the rifle. And then the G2 pattern was a further modernized version uh, that was adopted by the French Navy. Uh, and the two main things that it changed were, well, Visually, it went from a single finger trigger guard to that whole hand trigger guard, kind of like a Styrog. That's the easiest way to recognize them you know, in pictures and whatnot. Mechanically, the G2 uh, went from a 1 in 12 twist barrel to I believe a 1 in 7, allowing the use of um, SS-109, uh, M855, modern NATO ammunition, as well as other heavier than 55 grain bullets. And it uh, changed the receiver profile to use AR-15 Stanag magazines. So if you have a FAMAS G2, I believe PMAGs will fit right in it. If they don't, it's only because of a weird detail or, you know, like the exact magazine stop height on the PMAG. Um, a FAMAS using AR-15 mags will work and has worked because that's what the French Navy adopted. Unfortunately, those are very rare. The Navy didn't buy a whole lot. And I want to say it's something like 10 or 20,000 of them, maybe a little bit more, but compared to something close to 400,000 of the standard F1 pattern being made. <clears throat> Tom, why did the French not adopt the Maxim gun? In World War I it seems like all sides used the Maxim, the Russians, Germans, and British, but not the French. Was it simply a matter of national pride and they wanted to use a French designed machine gun, or did the French simply believe that their guns were superior to the Maxim? We kind of got a little bit of each. Um, I'm sure there was an element of we'd rather use a domestic thing. Uh, there was an element of cost. If we use our own guns, theoretically they'll be cheaper because we're not paying the profit motive or the royalties for a private company like the Maxim company. However, there was also a, a seriously rational reason why the French didn't want not specifically the Maxim, but they didn't want a water-cooled gun. And that is because the French had a particularly large uh, colonial uh, empire in North Africa, in the desert, where there wasn't a whole lot of water. 
And if you try to run a Maxim gun without water, all of its magnificent sustained fire capabilities go away pretty darn quickly. Um, because the Maxim depends on water as a coolant, it uses a very thin profile barrel for a machine gun. It's kind of like a rifle profile barrel. And that sucker will overheat really quickly without a jacket full of water. So from the French perspective, if we're going to be using these guns in a lot of places where there isn't just much water lying around, we're better off using an air-cooled machine gun that relies on surface area and barrel mass uh, to stay cool. And that's why the Saint-Étienne gun and the Hotchkiss gun uh, are both air-cooled. Ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, of course, they ended up using their machine guns far more in France itself during World War I than they ever did in the colonies. So in hindsight, yeah, they would have been a lot better off with a Maxim gun, but you can't say that. Uh, you, they didn't know that. Nobody knew that prior to 1914. Next question is from Carl. Since you have acquired a FAMAS, do you have plans to get a hold of optics for it? Also, were there optics initially issued at the adoption of the rifle for use in DMR roles, or did the French army issue a different rifle? So two questions there. First off, um, I have actually acquired an optics rail for my FAMAS, sort of. There are a couple different ways that this was done uh, by the French. The simplest version is basically modifying the existing carry handle assembly uh, to have a Picatinny rail inside it. And there are a couple different ways that that has been done. Um, the one I have is it's not quite the military standard, but it works. It's okay. What I found using it is that it gives a really high bore offset. You get a pretty poor cheek weld, and the, the optics like way above the barrel. And the FAMAS has really pretty good iron sights. So I have kind of set aside the optics thing on the FAMAS and decided if I'm going to shoot it, I should shoot it as it was originally intended. That's really how it is better set up. Now today, um, the, the French did work on modernizing the FAMAS with what's called the Felin program, which is kind of the French equivalent of the US Future Warrior or Objective Warrior systems, integrating a lot of electro-optical and communications technology. So Felin mounts this gigantic scope assembly onto the rifle, which honestly it looks really goofy in pictures. You'll have to ju judge for yourself, how about that? Um, but that thing has a built-in laser rangefinder, it's got a built-in camera, uh, it's got a night vision scope built into it, as well as a standard magnified optic, it's got controls in the front grip, you can, it comes with a, like a little touchscreen computer system on your web gear, you can coordinate with other members of the squad, you can take pictures, send pictures, uh, it's, it's really a cool system if it didn't involve this gigantic thing on top of the rifle. And in order to make that even remotely practical, they had to come up with something better than mounting it on top of what was already a really tall carry handle. So uh, they came up with what was called the, um, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation on this, but um, the Surbasse or Valorise uh, model of the FAMAS, which means either improved or lowered. And what they did basically was take the charging handle, the trigger hook sort of charging handle, inside the carry assembly, tilt it over onto its side, and then drop the carry handle down, replace it with just a piece of rail, and they dropped, it's probably an inch, inch and a half lower, and then they mounted this gigantic Feline scope on top of that. So that's the much better optical system. What you do is you take the Feline scope, especially as an individual collector, and you go up and get rid of it, and you put a modern red dot, or magnified optic, but I would go with a red dot, on that lowered uh, Picatinny rail. And that's actually what a lot of French soldiers do today. Um, they have these Valorise pattern rifle, FAMAS rifles, and they don't always take that Feline system into the field if it's not practical for whatever the mission is. They'll instead put something like an E-Attack or an Aimpoint on that rail. Now would I like to get one of those for my FAMAS? I would love to, it would be fantastic. Unfortunately, in order to, the, the process of doing that also involved changing up the iron sights, which are mounted uh, fixed to the barrel of the rifle, and if you take out the carry handle um, or lower it, you've got these iron sights that are sticking weirdly, awkwardly up. Um, and when they did the Valorise, they changed, they got rid of those things. And I don't want to like permanently get rid of the iron sights on my rifle, which is not to say that I actually have access to a modernized lowered carry assembly, which I don't. But 
if I was going to do that, I'd probably have to come up with a second FAMAS to convert like that, and that would be an extremely expensive proposition and one that is unlikely to happen, unfortunately. Uh, next question is from Lila. Says, why did the French adopt en bloc style clips when everyone else went the internal magazine route? Uh, I think that is actually kind of a misconception. Um, there were a lot of other people who took the uh, the, the Monlicker style clips. So the Italians with the Carcano in 1891 went with a Monlicker en bloc clip. Uh, the Austrians with the 1895 Steyr straight pull went with a Monlicker en bloc clip. The Romanians, the Dutch, um, also used Monlicker type rifles with end block clips. Um, it's almost like a 50 50 split between stripper clips and end block clips. So um, the reason the French went with it specifically is because they adopted that for the Bertier carbine. The Bertier was originally um, adopted as a cavalry carbine, and they wanted it was the, the reason they didn't use a tube fed rifle was in large part to have something that could be more easily loaded on horseback. And a Monlicker packet and in block clip is going to be a lot easier to work with than a stripper clip when you're on horseback. Less chance of cartridges like twisting out and falling all over the place. So that's why the French went with it. Hans says, uh, what French military arms are currently available on the surplus market for a reasonable cost? Actually a lot of them. Um, the, the Moss 4956 has gone up recently. Um, they're getting close to like a thousand bucks in the US right now. Um, they used to be more like 600, um, so the, the heyday for buying those things has kind of passed. Uh, but you know they're still far cheaper than buying, you know, you want to find an original military surplus FAL or G3 that isn't a parts kit build? Good luck, you're going to pay a crap load of money for one of those things compared to a 4956. Um, those were imported as complete rifles. Um, they may have a Century import mark on them because Century imported a lot of them, but as long as you avoid getting one that was converted to 308, that is a totally stock military rifle. In fact, it's one that was refurbished by the military before being put in storage, before being sold as surplus. So, you know, today you look at the prices someone will pay for an actual legit HK produced German receiver HK91, well, that's your only option with a 4956. There are no Century receiver parts kit builds of those. Um, so in that way they're still an excellent value. Uh, the Moss 36 is out there for pretty much across the board. The French rifles are, are less expensive than German or American guns of the same period. So Moss 36s are out there, the 3651 grenade launching rifles are out there. Both of those are often in extremely good condition because they were uh, refurbished by the French military, then put into reserve storage you know, for use in a possible war, and then when they were deemed obsolete they were sold as surplus, still basically in new condition. Um, Berthiers are available. You can still get a Berthier carving in for 400 bucks, um, depending on the type. So I think a lot of that is because there's a lot of variation in Berthiers that a lot of people aren't really familiar with, and um, I suspect those prices will go up when my book comes out because, uh, not to be overly unhumble about it, but um, I think that'll give people a lot more information so they'll understand what they're looking at and it'll become more interesting, especially the the good proper versions of them and the rarer versions of them will go up in price at that point, but today there's still some real bargains out there. Um, Labelles, however, have gone up in value quite a lot. Um, Labelles used to be like a four or $500 gun and now they're regularly $1,000 rifles. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that, first off, a lot of them are antiques and thus uh, exempt from most US law. A lot of them I think may actually be being purchased by Europeans and shipped back to Europe where they're even more expensive than they are here, and because of their antique status that's not that's easier to do than with some other guns. And of course because of the anniversary of World War I. The Labelle is kind of the iconic French rifle of World War I. And they're very popular because people are starting to get more interested in that conflict because of its centenary. Uh, really the one French rifle that's not available is the FAMAS, um, because only a very only a couple hundred of those came in in the late 80s um, as semi-autos. Next up is from Justin, said, are there themes in French small arms design that reflect a particularly French manual of arms? Have these peculiarities lessened over time as NATO was re was established? There's kind of only one, and that's the lack of a safety. Um, 
the early French rifles didn't have safeties because arguably they didn't really need them. Uh, you know, the Chaspo and the Gras. If you only have a single shot rifle and your doctrine is based on, you know, groups in in formation firing volleys on command, well, you're not going to load the rifle until you're being ordered to load it in preparation for firing it. So do you really need a manual safety? Eh. Um, and then that kind of transitioned over to the Lebel and the Berthier. Um, and it was there that it became kind of a particularly French feature to have a repeating rifle without a safety. And then what's particularly unusual is that even the Moss 36 has no manual safety to it. Um, this manual of arms of you don't load the rifle until you're ordered to and you just leave the chamber empty until you're ready to fire, that is an, an unusually French thing. Now, when they went to semi-auto rifles, both the Moss 44 pattern and onward, and the RSC rifles from World War One, those all have safeties, because on a semi-auto rifle you really have to. Beyond that, I wouldn't say that there's any particular French unique specific characteristic to the rifles. Um, there are some things that were unusual at the time, but they don't tend to be the same in different, you know, we're talking different generations of rifles. So you have the Moss 36 from the 30s. You have the semi-auto rifles, which are basically from the 50s, 20 years later. You've got the FAMAS then, which is from the 70s, 20 years after that. And the, the things that are kind of unique and unusual about the guns would change in those 20-year time periods. Next up is Thaddeus, who says, if the French had managed to produce their auto-loading rifle prior to the German invasion, presumably the uh, World War II invasion, uh, would it have made any significant impact? I think the answer is no. Uh, the, the French military's problems uh, in World War II in the Battle of France were far beyond uh, the, the possibility of simply small arms fixing. I think that would have made absolutely no difference at all. Next up is Chris, uh, who has a cool question here. What was the status of the French state-owned arsenals like Saint-Étienne during the occupation in World War II? Were they still making French rifles for the Vichy government, or were they simply not in use? Were there any examples of them being repurposed to produce uh, arms for other Axis powers? There actually are. So um, offhand, I'm not sure what Toulon and uh, Chatellerot were doing at the time, but Saint-Étienne, I can explain it fairly well. Uh, they did make submachine guns. The Moss 38 was manufactured uh, for the Vichy forces, um, for the police more likely. Um, the, there was a 22 caliber trainer version of the Moss 36 that was manufactured, again for the Vichy government. And then the main thing was actually Saint-Étienne became one of the main producers of German G43 receiver forgings. So they didn't make complete guns, but G43 receivers, excuse me, were produced at Saint-Étienne through the war. And it was actually the when the, the American forces liberated, or when uh, Free French forces liberated Saint-Étienne, uh, that shut down a major German source of parts for their G43 production. So you'll see G43 production really take a, a dive right at that point in, I believe it was October of 44, as a result. Uh, next question is from Nicholas. Will your book cover flavors of the tabatière? I know you aren't a fan of muzzleloaders, but conversions should be more interesting. So the, the tabatière is like the, the French equivalent to the Snyder or the Trapdoor Springfield. They are conversions of muzzleloading rifles uh, to uh, breech loader, cartridge firing breech loaders, where you like open the breech up the side. They, they're most similar to the Snyder. Um, and my book is not going to cover those. Uh, I am sticking to uh, starting with the Chaspo and then the Gras. Um, partly because I have no experience with the Tabatier. I don't have any myself. Um, and as conversions, they kind of aren't the same as the, uh, the purpose-built military firearms um, that the army specifically was using. Uh, next up is Antigonus, who says, the French military was one of the few militaries to adopt an entirely new standard rifle cartridge between World War I and World War II. Given that bolt actions remained the standard in World War II, in your view, would they have been better off adopting an intermediate cartridge instead of full power 75 by 54 uh, Well, first off, 75 is actually one of the lighter of the full power cartridges. It is um, a bit lighter uh, in power than the 7.62 NATO. Would they have been better off with an even lighter cartridge? In a, uh, yes, 
but in a bolt action rifle, I'm not sure it really would have made that much difference. Um, they would have been better off, ideally, if they'd produced the Moss 40 and also uh, with large ca large capacity magazines and in an intermediate caliber cartridge. And basically, like if they developed the Sturmgewehr themselves, they would have been better off. Um, regardless, it wouldn't have made a difference, as we talked about a couple questions ago. But I think the intermediate cartridge was the clear winner here. That's what we've seen today. And so had they made more, made longer strides towards that earlier, overall they would have been better. But it wouldn't have made a, a, an actual uh, quali quantitative difference in World War II. Robbie asks, uh, Every collector and gun enthusiast seems to have a garbage rod or two hanging around their collection. So as a fan of French firearms with, as we have seen, quite a nice French collection, do you have plans on acquiring a Chatellerot made Mosin M91 to round out the collection? Yes, yes I do, but I haven't yet because they tend to be pretty expensive and I just haven't justified it yet. So if you're not familiar with what we're talking about here, uh, when the Russians adopted the Mosin Nagant, the model of 1891 Mosin Nagant, while they were tooling up uh, to get production going in Russian factories, they actually started by purchasing a big bunch of the guns from the Châtellerault arsenal in France. So these are difficult for uh, you know the, the typical gun show patron to spot because they don't actually say Châtellerault on them, they say Châtellerault written in Cyrillic, which just looks like Russian gobbledygook uh, to those of us who can't read Russian. Uh, however, I would definitely be interested in getting one, I just haven't been able to justify the cost because ultimately it's not a French rifle, it's just it's a Russian rifle made on contract in France. So um, not really the focal point of my collection. If I ever find a really good deal on one, yeah I'll definitely get it. Uh, the other issue here is uh, these the, the Châtellerault rifles are almost really the only source we have for them here in the United States is by way of Finland. Examples that were uh, purchased or captured uh, by the Finns when they declared independence, those have all been rebuilt to finish specifications. So they still have the receiver markings, but the sights, the sling swivels, and some of the, the, the parts that are really unique to the very early, the first couple of years of, of M1891 1891 Mosin Nagant production, things like having a little finger stop on the trigger guard, having a sling swivel on the magazine well, those things the Finns generally upgraded and modernized and got rid of. So finding a Châtellerault Mosin Nagant in its original configuration is, is pretty difficult, and I have little hopes of ever finding one of those at a price that I can justify. Next question is from Justin, uh, who, here we go, here's our second one on the FAMAS. Having shot a FAMAS possibly more than any other American, uh, what in your opinion could be improved on on the rifle for a hypothetical version 2 which will never exist? Uh, basically make it more optics compatible make it uh, Stanag magazine compatible, and and then you could, there are some things that could be done to make it a little bit more ambidextrous. So it's really cool that it can be switched without any extra parts from left to right handed. The one thing that would be a little bit better than that is being able to actually basically hot swap it, you know, have it in its left hand configuration but be able to shoot it from the right shoulder if you're say going around a corner. And I think with the right sort of deflector um, either clipped on or sort of built into uh, to the stock assembly, you could get that so that while cartridges are mostly coming backwards, you could get them deflected downward, probably, um, and make the, the gun really truly ambidextrous. Um, the action requires no update at all. Um, it's a very simple action, it's an accurate system. You know, change the iron sight setup to one like the Valhorgisé, uh, easily adapted to optics, and I think you have what is arguably a very modernizable rifle that could still do good service. But of course, this will never happen. Next question is from Joel, who says, if you had to pick an overall most practical French weapon of World War I, what would it be? And I'm going to once again, uh, for the same reasons that we talked about earlier, I'm going to say the five round Berthier carbine. It was short, it was handy, it had the best capacity, the fastest reloading um, of French rifles of World War I. Um, I'd rather have a five round packet loader than an eight round tube magazine, and I'd definitely rather have a rifle that is shorter overall than the giant pike of the Labelle or the 0715 Berthier. 
Next question is from Lewis, who says, did the French use a version of the Gatling gun during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870? No. Um, they did, well, they had a gun in that same category. Uh, it was called the mitrailleuse, which has today become just the word for machine gun. What it was at the time was a multi-barreled gun. So they were 25 barrel um, volley firing guns. So they kind of look like cannons, because they've got a big, big breech assembly or barrel assembly like this that has 25 individual barrels in it, and they feed from this big cartridge block. It's a big metal plate, uh, yay size, that holds 25 cartridges, and you drop it into the gun, close the breech, and then you've got a, a lever that fires all 25 barrels in succession. <coughs> Open the breech, pull out this block with its 25 now empty cartridge casings, replace it. This was a major French secret weapon going up into the Franco-Prussian War. The problem was it was so secret that they didn't really do any training with it, they didn't do any familiarization with it, and as a very early type of pseudo-machine gun, they didn't really understand the best way to use it, and they set it up to be used like artillery. They were trying to use this to combat, like to use counter-battery fire on German artillery. Well, the problem is proper artillery has a range that is definitely longer than, say, 11 millimeter um, lead rifle bullets. And, and as a result, the mitrailleuse was really almost ineffective in the way that they were trying to use it. There were very few situations where they were brought up um, and used at close range against infantry. They were a lot more successful there, but that didn't happen very often, um, and certainly didn't affect the outcome of the war. In fact, what's interesting is if, if the mitrailleuse had any long-lasting um, effect, it was a lot of observers who looked at how it was used, saw that it was completely ineffective, and kind of scorned the whole machine gun volley fire concept uh, for decades to come. Uh, I've been ignoring my tea there, and it's all gotten cold because I just keep talking. <clears throat> Next up is Adam who says, what are your thoughts on the French army moving away from the FAMAS and beginning the use of the HK416? Um, given that there is no longer a military scale rifle factory in France, it, is, it was inevitable that they would adopt a some other foreign rifle. Uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with the, well, there are some uh, obsolete aspects of the FAMAS design, but it's not a bad gun, it's just it was adopted in 79, it is now 2018, or when they started doing this it was 2016, uh, more than a 35 year lifespan on a combat rifle. It's time for something that's newer and better. They need a rifle that can use optics, they want a rifle that's more modular, that can a, a, you know, better fit things like the Feline system, or hopefully the more modernized equivalents of it. Um, as for the 416, it, we talked about this on an in-range Q&A recently. There are not a whole lot of options if you are a large national military force looking to buy rifles. You're not going to go to Desert Tech and buy their bullpup, because they're not going to be able to make you 300,000 of them. It just ain't going to happen. You have to go to one of the major industrial you know, arms-making hubs of the world, and there aren't a whole lot of those left. So the French and the British ones are gone. You've got HK. Um, you've got Beretta, could conceivably do it. Uh, CZ could probably pull it off. <clears throat> um, but there aren't really any American companies that one would look to. You know, if do, look at look at how we we treat Colt. Look at Colt bankruptcy uh, scandals of the last few years. Do you want to trust your national military to trying to get Colt to make you three hundred thousand rifles? No, you don't. I uh, certainly hope you don't. Um, FN could do it. So really you've got HK, FN, CZ, and Beretta. And that, those are kind of your choices. And of those, the 416, it may be a little bit heavy, but it is a durable rifle. It's pretty well proven. It's got other people adopting it, especially uh, early adopters in the special forces community have really kind of um, worked out all the kinks with those, with the, the details of those guns. It may not be the rifle that I want personally, but it makes a, a very compelling military choice. And looking at the other options that France had, um, I don't know that I would want the VHS bullpup. Um, 
FN, I'm a little surprised that they didn't give more con more consideration to the FS2000 or the F2000, but I don't know all the details there. Um, I wouldn't want the Beretta ARX system. I think the HK416 is preferable to it. And um, uh, the CZ Bren, I haven't, I really don't have any serious hands-on time with one of those, so I can't really speak to the, the Bren, the CZ Bren. But given their options, the HK is, is hard to criticize. Next question is from uh, Jake. It says, what in your opinion was the best firearm for its time fielded by the French military? Uh, I realize more modern firearms like the FAMAS are probably technically better than older stuff, but if you could pick a time period and a firearm from that period, um, what, what would it be? The answer is easy, that is absolutely the Lebel. When we, we don't maybe think about this so much today, because everyone just is used to black powder. In fact, we're even used to black powder substitutes in, in black powder guns, so they all behave like smokeless powder. Um, sorry, we're all used to smokeless powder today. When the Lebel was adopted, it was absolutely fundamentally better than every other military rifle out there because of that smokeless powder cartridge. It was far flatter shooting, it was far higher velocity, it didn't create clouds of smoke that would either obscure your own troop's vision <coughs> or reveal their position to the enemy. It was, without any doubt, a revolutionary and fundamentally uh, top of its class firearm. Now the problem was, because they rushed its development, they ended up with a system that didn't have a lot of longevity to it. And it would only be a few years uh, before a lot of other people would have guns that were equivalent to, or actually better than, the Lebel. But when it was adopted, you know, 1886, 1887, 1888, that, that couple of years right there, absolutely Lebel. Uh, we have just a couple left here. The next one is from Stefan, or Stephen, I'm not sure which, says, why does the French government keep so much information as state secret, even though information from World War II couldn't possibly be useful to any other country at this point? It's not just World War II, it's even World War I, but there's actually a rational explanation, and that is the French archives don't have a system of automatically declassifying classified information. So if they classified information on, let's say, design of the RSC rifle, or production of it, in World War I, in 1918, that information is going to remain classified until someone actually tries to, um, tries to access it, discovers it's classified, and then requests that it be declassified. Once someone makes that request, then the archive and the government will go through and decide if it still needs to be classified, and if it's not, they declassify it, and you can look at it all you like. But that doesn't happen automatically. So when you're trying to research something that other people haven't looked at before in the French system, you will often run into classified information, because you're just the first person to try and look at it. So that's why. Interestingly, there are a few exceptions, and one of them was archival records on the French mutinies of 1917. Some of that information was sealed for 50 years, and some of it was sealed specifically for 100 years. And I haven't had a chance to really dig into it, and I don't know that I would find anything in English yet. But um, in 2017, just last year, uh, a lot of records about the French mutinies would have uh, become available to the public for the very first time. And I suspect, I hope, we're going to see some really interesting good scholarship about that period of events coming out in just, you know, in the next couple of years as proper historians are able to uh, to take those newly available records and really amalgamate them into the, the current existing understanding of that period in the war. Christian asks, uh, were there many examples of the Moss 40 produced before the Germans invaded, or is it similar to what would become the 49 where the plans were smuggled to Britain? Um, if there were any made before, how come the Germans didn't have them produced in large numbers? There's a really cool answer to that question. Um, first off, there weren't many produced. Uh, they were in early field trials right at the beginning of the war. And when it became, when Germany declared war, they, they kind of did everything they could to rush de production and or development and finalization of, of that rifle, and it just didn't work out. Um, a few of them probably actually saw service in the Battle of France, but we're talking a couple hundred guns total, probably. Now what's really cool about it is uh, the, these were being developed or being produced at Saint-Étienne, and they were also making a bunch of other guns, like Moss 36s. Part of the development plan for the Moss 40 
was to have it uh, as compatible as possible with the tooling for the MOS 36, develop both guns simultaneously and economize between the two. Um, and in fact the MOS 40 had a fixed internal five round magazine like the MOS 36. So there weren't these detachable magazines floating around to be used. That was really the main change to the rifle after the war when it was finally put into production. What they did at Saint-Étienne was they smuggled <coughs> The, the blueprints and the technical package and the documentation out and hid it, and then they disguised the MOS 40 production line as a MOS 36 production line. And the receivers and the barrels and most of the other parts at a glance look similar enough that, as far as I can tell, the Germans never caught on that there was a semi-auto rifle on the cusp of mass production at Saint-Étienne. And for that reason it never occurred to them that they might need to produce it, because they didn't know it existed. All right, and our last question is from Demetrius, who says, Hi Ian, I love your work. Thank you. Uh, the French Gras and Labelle rifles and also Berthier carbines played a major role in the Greek resistance and also in the Greek Civil War later on. Although Greeks have an almost rom romantic relationship with the Gras and a lot of military history with it, I find it weird how they were able to put it to work against the Nazis, ammo shortages, etc. Can you give me any information on specific formats for the guns of that era and if you know of any other commonly used firearm of that conflict. I know some of them had the uh, the crest of St. George on them. Well, <clears throat> I don't have any specific information on Greek use of the Gras, however I do actually have a Greek uh, Berthier carbine. And what the Greeks did was actually cut down a lot of Berthier full-length rifles into carbines, and they did it in kind of a unique manner. Um, the barrels will be larger in diameter than standard production carbines, because they're cut down rifle barrels, and the Greeks actually put their own replacement sights on the guns. So uh, the sights really stand out. They're substantially different from French pattern Berthier sights. The bayonets are different. They don't fit a French bayonet. They fit a Greek uh, bayonet. And they're, they're out there. They're not super common, but they're not incredibly rare either. Uh, there will be pictures and description and there will be a section in my book on that Greek conversion because it is a really neat specific uh, uh, unusual uh, iteration of, uh, of the Berthier. And by the way it does have that Greek crest of St. George stamped into the stock. So uh, there will also be a standalone video coming on that rifle, but I haven't had a chance to do it yet. Whether that video comes out before the book does, I'm not sure at this point it might or it might not. But um, it will definitely be in the book. So uh, thank you guys for submitting the questions. It was kind of fun to do one specifically on my area of collecting focus, the, the French stuff. Hopefully uh, you guys are all also, if you're <laughs> certainly if you're still watching at this point, hopefully you will be interested in acquiring a copy of my print book when that does come out. I'm hoping that will be sometime in the spring, so it is still a couple months away. Um, at this point, when this is when this Q and A is being posted, we're right around the time period when we're doing photography for the book. Um, I have a professional photographer who's doing that, and it is going to be awesome-looking photography. It will be a really great-looking book. I'm really excited about it. Um, in addition to everything else, it's been a really fun project to work on. Um, everything you would need to know about that book you can find at FrenchRifleBook.com, and of course I have linked to that in the description text. So check that out for, uh, you know, be on the email notification list for updates on the book. And of course if you just want to get your own question into the next Q&A when we're not just talking about French stuff, uh, check out Patreon. Uh, these questions were all submitted by those of you who are patrons who step up and actually uh, directly support Forgotten Weapons. It is you guys who make this happen. So big thanks to all of you, and thanks for watching.